I'm, uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you about Wheat Midge today. So um, thank you everyone for being here and thanks for your attention. So we, uh, who here has dealt with Wheat Midge before? Okay, everybody. Good. Good. All right. So um, I've called it the Wheat Midge Scourge, decades of combat, because really we've got about four decades of combat under our belt. So when Wheat Midge reared its ugly orange head, we had probably six, seven, even eight sometimes Agriculture Canada scientists working on this problem. So they didn't take it lightly. They didn't take the yield losses lightly. They threw a lot of public funds at this problem. And the result of that, I'm going to share with you today. So I can't take credit for most of this research, so I will have um, the names of the lead scientists who actually did the research up there. So fair warning, my own research is only coming right, right, right at the end. But I'll throw a few pictures that I took in there just to, uh, just to help things out. So back when uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada was much more simply called Agriculture Canada, um, we had the wheat midge kind of popped up in the 1980s. And we had three scientists in Saskatoon and at least three scientists in Winnipeg working on this problem. So if, if you're interested in wheat midge or any other insects, I'm on Twitter. There's my Twitter handle there, at TylerWist1, or you can reach me by email at uh, Canada.ca. So uh, we all have at Canada.ca. So if you know our first name, you can send us an email because the, uh, the ending is all the same. So here's the problem I'm going to tell you guys about today, the orange wheat blossom midge. So most uh, wheat growers just shorten this to midge. I call it wheat midge. Um, the orange, though, comes from its orange color. So there's an adult sitting on the side of my cage, and it's orange. And as you'll see, the larvae are orange. The eggs are orange. So it comes by that orange name. The blossom comes at, because uh, that's where it attacks. It attacks those, uh, those flowers as they're blossoming, not that you really see much in the way of awesome flowers on wheat. But it was called the most serious insect pest of spring wheat in Western Canada by two of the scientists in Winnipeg, Ian Weiss and uh, Marge Smith. I've actually hired Ian Weiss. He got early retired when they shut down Winnipeg. And uh, he is just amazing at ripping apart wheat heads looking for wheat midge. So, we, uh, we snap him up as a casual whenever we can to get through the massive volume of wheat heads that we dissect. So I want you to carefully look at this name because I'm going to test you guys after. This is the Latin or scientific name of the wheat midge. So it is Cytodiplosis mosolana. Um, actually, I'm not going to test you, but I want you to see this here, the S and the M, because that's going to come up later. This is the scientific name, and it's also what we use to talk about the resistance gene that works against wheat midge. So it is, in, it is a, a cecidomyid. So if you know anything about swede midge or our new canola flower midge, it is, those are also cecidomyid midges. So they're, they're small, delicate-bodied creatures, but uh, in the case of wheat midge, they can cause a lot of damage. So. In Manitoba, we had upwards of $50 million worth of yield loss, $130 million in 1995. So Bob Lamb was another one of the scientists who was working in Winnipeg, did a lot of work on wheat midge. He also did a lot of work on aphids. So now I kind of work on aphids and wheat midge, so I'm uh, potentially the new Bob Lamb in uh, Western Canada. So down here, we had, we had over 500,000 acres sprayed in 1995, and we still took 130 million in yield losses. So it kind of went down in crop losses as we go, but still, we're looking at huge hectares sprayed and still huge crop losses. So this is why it's earned its rank as the most serious insect pest of spring wheat. I call it the big bad in wheat. So here is a nice undamaged kernel. This is what you want to see in your sample. You don't want to see these down here. So these are shriveled kernels and they're caused by wheat midge larval feeding. You can actually see two of them hanging out right there. Check it out. Those third instars are orange, just like they're supposed to be. There's another one on that kernel there. So you will not see these typical 
shriveled kernels because they go at the back of your combine. So you're not going to see those, but you will see the ones uh, if you're growing SM1 wheat that have been damaged a little bit. So a bit about the life cycle. This, uh, this came from Owen Olfert. He's one of the Saskatoon scientists who did a lot of work on wheat midge. And this is the typical life cycle. So it overwinters in the ground as a cocoon. So these cecidomyids are kind of a weird insect. They're not actually a pupa at this stage. They're a third instar that make themselves an overwintering cocoon. And so in this overwintering stage, they can actually stay in the ground for 12 to 13 years if conditions aren't right. So these cocoons are like a ticking time bomb in your field. So maybe you had wheat midge a decade ago, but conditions haven't been right. They can wait out conditions and boom, out they come all at once. So this is how they spend the winter down there. And this is what they look like. So on the right, we've got canola seeds as a reference. And here are the midge cocoons. So this is what they look like down in the ground there. So those cocoons, remember how I said it's all weather dependent? Wheat midge is really dependent on wet weather. So Bob Elliott at the Saskatoon Center, he determined that you needed 25 millimeters in May. So between kind of end of April, May, maybe the first week in June, you need 25 millimeters to kickstart those cocoons. And when they get enough moisture and the ground is warm enough, they shed their cocoon, they come out as third instar larvae again, and then they pupate. So check that out. That is a, an ugly looking creature there, but that is a, a wheat midge pupa. So sometimes they'll make another cocoon again, depending on the conditions in the soil. But this one here is a naked pupa. So you can see its little eye there. There's the abdomen and it's orange because that's, that's its defining characteristic. So those pupae will hang around in the soil until you're ready to go to the lake on the July long weekend. And out they come as adults. And so this is where the boot is splitting. So they are timed really well with, uh, with a spring wheat crop and they time themselves well with that rainfall. So you've got a danger zone from heading. So as soon as that boot splits till about mid anthesis, that's your wheat midge danger zone. So here's a close up shot of the adult. I've got a pretty amazing microscope camera. And this guy here is looking a little bit crushed because wheat midge doesn't do well when it's dried out. So what I wanted to show you are the antennae right here. So you see these big things? It kind of looks like a radio antenna, right? So what they use their antennae for, this is a male. They use it for smelling females, which will come up later when I talk about pheromones. So these here, you're basically looking at the wheat midge's nose right now. So there's a female. Here's her business end down there. So she's got an ovipositor and she actually has a lot shorter antennae because she doesn't need to smell other females but uh, the males need to smell females and be the first ones there. So they've got much longer antennae. So that's one of the ways you can tell uh, males and females apart. So this is during the daytime, and this is what the wheat midge adults like to do during the daytime. They just hang around down in the crop because they like it humid and they don't like wind. So they will just wait it out down here until things calm down in the evening and out they come at dusk. And that's when they do their oviposition or egg laying. So there's a little clutch of eggs there. Typically your wheat midge will drop one to four eggs on a single floret and then move on. So you can see it's got beady red eyes there. And if Hollywood has taught us anything, it's that things with red eyes are evil. So <laughs> we now know that wheat midge is evil because it has red eyes. So these are the eggs and so you'll see this as soon as the boot splits and they'll stay eggs for about five to seven days. There's another close up of the eggs, but kind of pulled back a little bit. There's three or four sitting right there in a clutch. And these are the first instar larvae. They look a lot like eggs, but uh, they're just kind of little orange specks. Pretty hard to see with the naked eye, but you can see them if you look close closely. So this is eggs hatch, then you get a first instar larva. It goes through three larval instars. So they get bigger, bigger, and then they drop down to the ground. So here's a close up of the second instars. So they're big and fat and orange right there. 
and there's two hanging out. So two like that will do fairly significant damage to a kernel. So then we get to our third N star, and this is just a weird creature. So here's our third N star, and it just hangs out in the skin of its second N star. So when you've got your skeleton on the outside of your body, you have to shed that skeleton to get bigger. So this guy, instead of just shedding the skeleton, just hangs out inside of it, and it actually goes quiescent, which means it just sits there, doesn't feed, doesn't do anything, and it waits for those August rainstorms to come along, and when it does, that activates them, then they shed their second skin, and they drop to the ground, and that's when they hang out on the soil surface for a little while, and then they'll form a cocoon down there. So there are a couple of third instars that have dropped to the ground, and you guys are in for a treat. I've got a video here for you. So check these out. These are third instar wheat midge larvae. They've dropped down onto the soil surface. We're going to speed it up for you. Keep your eye on this section right here. We're going to have a couple of larvae. This one here is starting to do it. So they just kind of wiggle their way down into the ground. So there it goes. There goes another one. Yeah. So, I mean, this is artificial conditions, but this is what you'll see if you got your face right down to the ground right after a rainstorm. So ground is wet, these things become active, they go down in the ground, they spend a little while down there and then they make that overwintering cocoon. So we've got a wheat midge colony and so at this stage we just kind of put them on the lab bench for a month to let them get ready to overwinter. Um, I put these three larval instars together just to show you the size difference. So there's a first instar, there's a first instar, here's a second. So the seconds are really active, and I couldn't get a good shot of them. They keep running away, so it's, uh, it's heading off this way. But kind of gives you an idea of the size. Then there's that weird third instar, and it's hanging out inside its second instar skin. So it's just waiting for the rainstorm there. So if your crop is sitting in the swath, and you still have wheat midge in the heads, and you get a little bit of, of uh, humidity or dew on your crop, that is enough to get them to go from the heads down into the soil, too. So very, very dependent on moisture, this creature is. So a little relationship between infestation in your field to yield loss. And uh, Owen worked this out in 1985. That was the first big explosion of wheat midge in Western Canada. Um, if we go back in time, they think that there was two introductions of wheat midge, but it didn't really do anything until the 1980s. So if you've got zero kernels infested, your yield is good. Of course it is. At 30% kernels infested though, you've got a 40% yield loss. All the way up to 90% of your kernels infested, you're going to lose about 80% of your yield. So I'm sure nobody wants to see that happening, right? So you want to assess your risk for next year based on a few key principles. So did your wheat get downgraded when you took it to the elevator last year? If so, you've probably got midge in the ground. Is your field irrigated? Because if you're irrigating your field in the spring, you're also irrigating your wheat midge. And you can have these little weird pockets where irrigation keeps the wheat midge population high, but all the fields that are not irrigated don't have any wheat midge. So you can also check your region for the forecast maps. So this is a service that, uh, that our province and Agriculture Canada puts together. And uh, we put them out sometime in December. So, the wheat midge forecast map is based on soil coring. So I'm going to describe it for you. We have got these soil corers here that we drive down into the ground and then we hit them with a hammer <laughs> to get that soil core to come out. I'm sure there's got to be a better way, but we haven't really figured it out yet. And so these are three of my students and uh, they are doing some soil cores in the field. Not part of the survey, this was for a different project, but there's our bag of soil cores there. So in 2017, we were trying a soil core and the ground was so dry, we just got bags of dust, basically. It took a lot of hammer whacking, too, to get those soil cores to come out. So here's 2016. Remember, 2016 was a little bit wetter than 17 was. But we've got these kind of pockets here of wheat midge. So what uh, the government of Saskatchewan does is they contract someone to go do all those soil coring, and then she brings the soil cores back and washes them in water and washes those cocoons out and then counts them based on the number of wheat midge. And then we've got a um, kind of a 
um, formula, a mathematical formula that Bob Elliott had worked out that translates those soil cores into number per meter squared. So the uh, kind of light green, they didn't find any wheat midge here. This looks like a big number. This is uh, around 600 per meter squared, but it actually makes, makes it green here, and that's kind of a small number. Um, then the red ones are what you want to worry about. So you want to look at these, find your RM on the map, and know whether or not you should be growing SM1 wheat and scouting your crops on a regular basis. Here's the forecast for 2017 right there. Um, as you can see, these kind of regions are getting bigger and bigger and spreading out. And so it's all related to moisture. So if we were to overlay a soil moisture map on here, it would correlate really well to those red areas. Alberta, they do a very similar thing with the soil cores, but they also have a pheromone monitoring network. So they know how many adults are coming out at a given time in each week. And so that's what all these dots on the map are. Those are pheromone traps. And so they're actively monitored by, by producers and by people working for the Alberta government. And that data is fed, not quite real time, but almost onto their website. So you can go onto there and see if you've got uh, wheat midge adults flying in you know, the field next to you, in your RM, let's say. And so they'll keep posting those in June and July because those adults are coming out end of June, beginning of July. So here's our 2018 forecast. So this is last year, just green. So what a great time to be a wheat midge researcher. Good time to be a wheat farmer, <laughs> but not so much for uh, studying wheat midge. So a few little pockets down here at the Langenberg area. We actually went down there and we were able to, uh, to collect wheat midge in the heads. So these maps are posted on the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network site. Anybody here subscribe to that? Let's put your hand up if you're subscribed. So check it out online. You should subscribe. You just get weekly emails. They talk about uh, insects of the week. All these maps, as soon as they come out, they get posted to Prairie Pest Monitoring. And there's, uh, there's sometimes cool articles written by scientists that'll come out as well. And the activity is right during the growing season. So the information that comes to you is really timely information. So no pheromone trapping networks. So what we see here is all based on 420 um, fields. So they'll go out to each of the RMs and do those, those soil cores. Here's our 2019. There's 2018 again. It's all green still. So it was so dry last year that wheat midge just did not do very well. Couple pockets where it was uh, wet, and they got those couple of rainstorms, but shouldn't be too much trouble in 2019 with the wheat midge. But remember, they're still in your field because conditions haven't been very good for the last few years. So we try to forecast adult emergence, and this is another service that Agriculture Canada puts out, and it'll go on Prairie Pest Monitoring blog as well. And so this uses degree days. So insects, they don't develop like we do. If it's hotter, they grow faster. And so they can have a number of degree days packed into one kind of hot day. So this uses that soil moisture to kind of kickstart them. And it's a model of wheat midge emergence. So instead of us having the monitoring network of pheromones, we're trusting that the model is telling us when the wheat midge is coming out. So we've got percent emergence over here. So at about 90% emergence, you're getting color changes. So that one's just an example there. But these get posted. So you can say, all right, I'm, uh, I'm sitting right here around Saskatoon. How many wheat midge should there be? What kind of percentage of emergence are we at? So here's that boot splitting. This is your first sign of danger. And when you get to this section right here, we've got a couple of wheat midge just hanging out on the head. But your wheat's not really susceptible there. So Bob Elliott showed that survival of wheat midge larvae on anthesis and then post-anthesis wheat just goes way down. They don't do very well. So then the susceptibility is the boot stage to about mid-anthesis. So when it's susceptible, you want to be regularly monitoring this. So don't forget about your tillers, though. So if your primary heads have escaped the wheat midge because you planted early and you've got an early maturing variety, you might have tillers that are vulnerable a couple of days later. And your secondary tillers, they might be vulnerable as well. So 
Keep watching your crop whenever you've got heads that are vulnerable. So your battle plan out there. So you want to scout the adult activity at the start of susceptibility of your crop. You can use an insecticidal spray if you need to, but really I'd suggest planting midge tolerant wheat varieties if you know that you're going to have a wheat midge problem or if you suspect that you're going to have a wheat midge problem. So here's a sweep net and it's been inverted. You can see that it's probably um, around anthesis because we got all the yellow flowers, but all those orange things, those are all wheat midge adults. So this is not what you want to see when you're scouting your field. I mean, I love seeing this, but I'm, I'm the only guy in the province that loves that. So when you're scouting, wheat midge is a really inconsiderate pest. Like I said, it likes coming out when you want to be at the lake on the long weekend, and it likes to come out when you want to be having supper and not going out checking your field. So you want to scout in the evening or really, really early in the morning. So what uh, Bob Elliott suggests is farmers count adults at sunset during the period from heading to flowering. So you can use yellow sticky cards. That'll tell you when the adults are flying through your field if you don't really want to be out there scouting, but there's no good correlation between yellow sticky card counts and yield damage. So this yellow sticky card trapping is just to say, hey, I've got wheat midge flying around and I should be looking at my crop. Pheromone traps uh, work as well. So I'll tell you a bit about how pheromones work in a second. Now the economic threshold for wheat midge is based on a visual threshold. So I'm going to demonstrate it for you. So you're out in your field and you want to protect your yield. You're going to kind of go down and you're going to be looking at five heads and you're just going to stare at those five heads. It's about 8.30 at night, so it's not that dark, but it's getting calm and the wheat midge are starting to move. So if you see one wheat midge, you're at the yield threshold. Now. If you want to maintain your grade, so you want to keep the wheat midge from, getting, from downgrading your crop when it gets to the elevator, you want to look at 10 heads, and you're looking for one wheat midge on 10 heads. So 1 and 5, or 1 and 10, those are the numbers that you want to take away from this talk today. So you can also take a look at the, at the kernels and see if you can see larvae or see eggs or anything on there. Um, if you're looking at a short variety, you're going to have to get right down on the ground because you want to be at eye level. So Chris was talking about carberry. You got to get right down there. <laughs> Take a look at that ground. So here's a, here's a shot. Can you guys see the wheat midge in this picture? It's like a where's Waldo. Can you count how many we've got there? Do you think we're at an economic threshold? Yeah. Are we at a, a yield threshold or a grade threshold? Yeah, we're above grade, definitely. So we got seven going on there. So there are the wheat midge adults. So this is what you don't want to see when you're scouting your crops. So pheromone trapping, this is fun. Um, remember how my intro said I worked in chemical ecology? This is chemical ecology. So you got males out there, and they're really simple. They try to find females by smell. So female lets out a pheromone and it kind of comes out in these little packets of odor. And so she's sitting around waiting for a male, and she starts, this is actually called calling. So she is calling for a male right now. And he's got those big antennae, and he starts flying, and he picks up these little packets of odors, and he finds the female by flying down this gradient of odors. So the, uh, the grease lab out in Simon Fraser University, they do some real magic where they cut off the insect's antennae and they can figure out what those insects are responding to. And so they figured out that this single compound here was being released by the female. So this is the, the female pheromone. So here comes the male. He thinks he's flying to a female and pheromone trapping means that he doesn't find a female, he goes splat onto the trap. <laughs> so check out those long antennae there. So they're at least twice as long as that female. So he's a, he's a late wheat midge. Now, in Europe, they kind of have a really rough estimate of yield loss to pheromone trapping. So I don't know if it's really applicable over here, but it's like 20 to 30 wheat midge on a pheromone trap over two days, and then you've got an economic problem. So this is just an example of 2016, um, and we had kind of a dry spring, 
and this is my Saskatoon farm here. These are my wheat midge nurseries, I call them. So I try to get more wheat midge by growing susceptible wheat on susceptible wheat on susceptible wheat. So I don't recommend that you do that because we should be building up the wheat midge population that way. So here we have last week in June and the wheat midge population has gone from basically zero up to about 300. So um, we had this weird peak though. So what probably happened was we had two separate rain events and it kick-started the development of the uh, wheat midge here. And then a couple weeks later, we had another peak in wheat midge. So the males tend to come out before the females. So your pheromone trapping gives you a, a quick little leg up, like a couple days before the females are out there. This is my Llewellyn site, and it was a little bit different. So it was a really slow buildup, and then the peak happened around the same time as that second peak in the Saskatoon field. And then it just dropped right off. So um, they'll hang around, but they're not really doing anything by then. So if you have to spray, you've got two options. You've got Laura's ban, or you've got Saigon or Ligon. So chlorpyrifos or dimethoate. Nice chemicals. Would you guys like using these in the field? Not really. Pretty bad LD50 for humans. So the Laura's ban is your best bet, probably, because it has a bit of a residual, and it will kill any eggs that are there. Uh, Saigon Ligon are just, they'll kill adults if they're in the field. And so you got to spray them when the adults are active and in the upper canopy. So you're spraying at dusk. Now, if you have to spray, try to spray as early as you can because you need to preserve the field heroes, the beneficial insects that are in your field. So you've got parasitoids that will keep the population of wheat midge down. But if you blast them with an insecticide, they're not going to do the job for you. So avoid late season sprays. So the biological control was worked out by the uh, group in Saskatoon. And so in 1992, they did a, a release. So they brought in a couple of parasitoids from Europe. So an original area where wheat midge was found, they brought in a couple of parasitoids. They released them down around the Langenberg area. Um, but we had one, and this one here is called yeah, so we got the three parasitoids, and John Doan actually worked this all out. I think Owen worked with him. This one here, Macroglenes penetrans, this is our dominant species, and it just showed up when the wheat midge showed up. These other two here, I hate saying their names, so I'm not going to, and they were the ones that were released in the early 90s. And this one established, and this one I didn't really think had established, but we actually found a couple of, of them not too long ago. So they are still down there in the Langenberg area. So the Macroglenes penetrans, you'll find these guys if you're out sweeping in your wheat field during the daytime. So they're diurnal, they'll come out at, at uh, daytime. And here they are right here, and there's one right there. And they are going after wheat midge eggs. So what these guys do is they'll lay eggs in the wheat midge egg, and then inside that wheat midge egg, as the wheat midge develops, the parasitoid just kind of goes along for the ride and it doesn't wind up killing the wheat midge until the following year. So remember I talked about those overwintering cocoons? You get those spring rains, and instead of a wheat midge adult coming out, you get a, one of these Macroglenes penetrans that comes out instead. So it actually reduces the number of wheat midge the following year. So don't spray them late, because these guys are coming out four to five days after the wheat midge. So they just hang around and they wait for the wheat midge to get out there laying eggs, and then five days later, which is about that egg laying period, out they come to lay their own eggs. So Macroglenes is really timed to those rains, just like the uh, wheat midge is. These other two maybe failed to establish because they weren't timed very well with the rains. All the Macroglenes adults have these big red eyes. They're just awesome. You can actually see them with the naked eye. So if you've got these little black specks with red eyes in your wheat field, it's probably uh, macroglenies that you're looking at. And macroglenies will do 40 to 45% overall, but in some fields you can get up to 100% parasitism of your wheat midge by macroglenies penetrans. So the idea to introducing these two is that you would have additive effects of parasitism on the wheat midge population. These are our farm savings again, and it's being touchy. So this is from uh, Wolfert's paper he published in 2009. 
So he figured that there was almost 16 million hectares of wheat that didn't require any pesticide application because that parasitism reduced the density of viable wheat midge below that kind of green threshold on the map. So those maps that we put out, they actually take into account parasitism. So someone's dissecting all of those wheat midge cocoons and getting a percentage of parasitism. And then those ones are taken out of the population. So on your map is just viable wheat midge. So there's our savings again. And uh, yeah, just big. So in the 1990s, they calculated that it was about $250 million across all of those years that these parasitoids did well. So last year, your wheat crop last year is probably going to be your canola crop this year. So this is just a caution that if you're spraying your canola crop about the same time that these parasitoids are coming out, they're coming out in your canola crop. So you've got to be cautious of spraying canola as well. And these little wasps like to feed on canola nectar. So they could be nectaring, they could be hanging out in your canola field, so just be careful that your canola insecticide application isn't going to be affecting your, your wheat midge control in the future. So this is a kind of a graphical representation of the spread of the wheat midge, but also the spread of the parasitoid. So this, this uh, blue here is pockets of wheat midge where the parasitoid hasn't shown up yet, and this is where the parasitoid is also present. So this is across the 1990s. So you can see that the wheat midge kind of spreads ahead. Now it's up here. We're, uh, we're giving the wheat midge to Alberta in this case. And it just kind of continues on like that. So that main parasitoid macroglenes follows the wheat midge population as it goes on down. So now where are we at with the parasitoid? They've come all the way down and uh, the parasitoid's being found down in the upper states and they've actually had big wheat midge problems down there, so they're happy about us sharing the parasitoid with them. So also, we have some predators in the field. So if you're going to be cocooning on the ground, you're opening yourself up to getting eaten by a ground beetle. So we've got four ground beetles here, and Kevin Float, he's at Lethbridge, he did a study on this, and we've got carabids, these guys are carabid beetles here, or they're ground beetles. So they're scuttling around your field at nighttime, you typically don't see them, because they're hiding under the dirt and they're kind of digging down and they're looking for wheat midge larvae. So all four of these together had a daily predation rate. So this is how many wheat midge they ate. 86 midge larvae per meter squared. So these guys are someone that you want to protect from blanket sprays on your field. So those two chemicals that I talked about earlier on, they will make your ground toxic to these ground beetles for a week after application. So always be careful. Um, only use those if you really need to. So this is our Field Heroes campaign funded by Western Grains Research Foundation. And there are the ground beetles down there. Th these are infographics that get posted up on Twitter. So they're a quick, easy way to transmit information to you, the grower, or you, the agronomists, for you to understand what could be in your sweep net. So here's our parasitoid macroglenies up here. And there's our ground beetles down there. Now, don't tell... Uh, don't tell anyone, but you're not going to get any ground beetles in a sweep because they're on the ground and you're sweeping up in your crop. So we just wanted to have them on that. Uh, maybe that's why they're down here near the handle. That could be. So it's got sort of the, uh, the typical beneficial insects that you'll find in your field. So midge-tolerant wheat. If you have a problem, you probably want to plant midge-tolerant wheat. And this was just groundbreaking when this came out. So Bob Lamb and... Uh, this was all Bob Lamb's group here. They actually found a gene that was in Clark Red Winter Wheat that was making those first instar larvae die. So they quickly got it bred into spring wheat, and that's why we have midge-tolerant wheat to this day. So remember I said there'd be a test, Cytodiplosis mosolana, here it is, SM1. So this is our one gene. And so it's one because it's the first gene, but it's also one because it's the only gene. So insects are really good at overcoming resistance, so I'm going to try to tell you how we can avoid them overcoming resistance to the SM1 gene. So the midge-tolerant wheat um, group, they say there is no plan B. So if we lose this trait, we'll be in trouble. We'll be back to spraying on a calendar or spraying Ligon Saigon in the field again. 
So 2010 was the launch of the Midge Tolerant Wheat, and so I think Good Eve was the first one to come out, but then we had Unity and Glen Cross as well. Note that every time you see a Midge Tolerant Wheat variety, it has a VB at the end, so that stands for Varietal Blend. So this is a refuge built right into your wheat, and I'll try to tell you what a refuge is right away. So by 2017, those three varieties had become 20 varieties that carry the SM1 gene. So this is now something that's typically tried to be bred into, into wheat. 2018, we got 28 varieties with SM1, so this was just last year's version. So in 2015, about one-third of prairie wheat acres was midge-tolerant wheat. It's available in all these classes here by 2016. And we've got a couple of Durham varieties, um, always with the VB, and Marchwell is the one that's widely available. Carbide is out there as well, but at the time it was kind of a limited release. So if you want to buy this, refer to your provincial seed guide for wheat that's suitable to your area. And there's lots of the lots of varieties, so you can find one that fits your area. Here's uh, just the name of some of them. So this is the tolerant variety, and it is going into that varietal blend. So 90% of your seeds are gonna be the tolerant variety. And then the refuge variety is worked into it to be you know, almost indistinguishable from your tolerant variety, but the refuge variety is susceptible to wheat midge. And so we built the refuge in to preserve uh, that SM1 gene. So the mode of action of this SM1, the first instar hatches out of its egg and it taps into that seed and it starts feeding and the plant reacts really quickly and it increases the levels of acid in the seed up to the level of the acids that are typically there at an anthesis or post-anthesis level head and the larvae hate the taste of it. They stop feeding and they starve to death. So when we're looking for SM1, we'll find dead first instar larvae and a few kernels that have been damaged because they have to take a bite of your crop to uh, get that SM1 to start working. So here's that, there is no plan B. Now, all this information is available on the Midge Tolerant Wheat website, and it is powered by uh, Western Grains and Sask Wheat and everybody who's got a stake in the wheat game. And so this is, uh, this is our representation of Wheat Midge there. So on the website, you'll see this, and the wheat will be kind of swaying back and forth because it's an animation, but it didn't have the animation in here. So this is SM1 wheat represented as red. So all of this red wheat here is 100% SM1. So in the case of 100% SM1, you've got these susceptible wheat midge, and they're represented in yellow, so they all die. But we also have some midge that uh, Marge Smith found published on in 2014, they called them virulent midge, and so these are resistant. So they don't die, so they're gonna stay alive, and they're the only ones available. So they turn into adults, and they find each other, and the magic happens, and now you've got offspring that have overcome the SM1 resistance. So they're out there, and we don't want them to take over. So this is an example of them taking over. Now the SM1 gene doesn't work. So they figure that refuge can break down in 10 years without, uh, uh, without the use of the refuge. So no more SM1 after 10 years unless we steward it. So here is the variety. So 10% of a susceptible variety is just worked into your field. What happens then is you have some of these susceptible ones that make it to adulthood. They find these virulent males, or males or females, and they breed out that resistance to SM1. So their offspring are not overcoming SM1. So they're going to be non-virulent because that uh, non-virulence, so the susceptibility is the dominant trait, fortunately. So then we don't get a big buildup of, uh, of those virulent midge. So you sign a stewardship agreement, and what you have to agree to is that you're not going to save seeds past two years. So why is that? All right. We need to maintain this refuge, and if your wheat midge is taking out the susceptible refuge, you're going to be losing it. So here's 50% loss in, uh, in year one of your refuge. Now that 90-10 blend is down to 95-5. 
So you plant 95.5 blend again, it's still okay, but year three, now you're down to 97.5 to 2.5, and we're low, we're down below a threshold where we can say that we're not gonna get the virulent midge build up. So this in year three shouldn't be happening. So at year three, you're gonna wanna buy certified seed again to uh, get that blend right back up. So we're trying to prevent 36 bucks an acre loss from midge damage. We want to reduce reliance on those harsh insecticides, and it gives you more flexibility on crop rotation and seeding day when you're using uh, midge-tolerant wheat. So we don't want it to break down in 10 years, and it should last. We've got one of these uh, infographics here, 90 years. So by the time you guys are all done farming, we should still have it. Now, one of the troubles was Curtis Posniak found a marker for SM1, and they found that a lot of your soft white spring wheat already had SM1, so it was naturally available there. So it's been sold without a refuge. So if you've got Sadash, Chiffon, or Indus, you want to mix in AC Andrew to make a refuge if you're trying to save uh, seeds from last year. So just to help with that stewardship. So what's coming in the future? We've got a project where we're looking at a new trait called overposition deterrence. So basically what's going on here is you get 50% less egg laying on overposition deterrent wheat. How am I doing for time? You're standing up. A little bit, okay. Good to hear. All right, so with this overposition deterrence, this came out of the, uh, the group in Winnipeg as well. You just have less eggs being laid, which is great. So to uh, figure out what was going on, this is an olfactometer. So a schematic of an olfactometer. So that is what it sounds like. It's a smell meter. So we're testing the smell in this case. So we use Roblin, which is really susceptible to wheat midge attack. So we got Roblin down in here. Up in here, though, we've got Key 10, which has this overposition deterrence. And the smell of the Key 10 is being blown into the chamber with Roblin on the left. This one here is just distilled water. So no smell is being blown in. And we still get reduced overposition so re less eggs on cultivar Roblin when the smell of Key 10 is circulating in there. So they don't like the smell of this overposition deterrent wheat. So we're kind of investigating this and uh, trying to figure out what is the mechanism going on here in overposition deterrence. So when I first started, I got an emailed picture from Robert Graff. He's a winter wheat breeder. And he said, hey, we got this turn of the century winter wheat variety called Jones Fife and look how hairy it is. So this could potentially be uh, mechanical resistance against that wheat midge. So it has to get onto the surface of the plant to lay eggs, and it has to get down there and make a decision. So if it's getting poked by all of these, uh, these hairs, these plant hairs, it might make a decision to just pick up and leave. So he's bred it into spring wheat already, and it's in New Zealand getting increased so that we can do some tests on it. And, uh, it's sort of, it's got a little bit of purplish, which is really interesting, because Pierre Huckle at the CDC, University of Saskatchewan, said, I've got a hairy wheat, it's already ready to go, it's out in the field right now. So this is CDC teal, and the, the haired variety is really, the, the gene for hairiness is really closely linked to the gene for purple. So these heads are kind of purplish out there, it's really, really quite interesting to see. There's a close-up of the hairs along the edge of the gloom, so we're looking at both of these two varieties as uh, potential mechanical resistance. This one came about when I talked to Kurt McCartney, who's the lone scientist in Winnipeg working on wheat midge. And he's like, well, you know, hairy wheat, that's interesting and all, but I've got a wheat variety that came out of a Mac 274 winter wheat where the wheat midge eggs don't even hatch. So that should make your heart stop, it's so exciting. So no wheat midge eggs hatching means no larvae feeding on your seeds, means no dockage at the elevator because you don't have midge damaged seeds. So I called this egg antibiosis. It just means that the plant is somehow attacking those eggs. We have no idea how it works at the moment, but um, it happens in some other plants. So the plants say, oh, I've got a, a bad egg on me, and they mobilize something to the surface and they wind up killing those eggs. So this is Roblin, highly susceptible, and this was 11 spikes, and we had 184 third instar midge. So they made it all the way through from egg to third instar. This is the MAC 274 line, zero, nothing. 
one dead first instar larvae, so one made it out of the egg. So very exciting. So could it be overposition deterrence? Maybe they just didn't lay eggs on the, uh, there was a lot of heads here. Uh, 120 spikes versus 11 spikes there. But no, they actually like laying eggs on Mac 274. So that was about 6.5 eggs per head, and Roblin was a little bit less. So it is not overposition deterrence. It is something completely different. And we now have a project funded by, by uh, Sask Wheat, Alberta Wheat, Manitoba Wheat and Barley, and Agriculture Development Fund to investigate these and hopefully bring these traits to market eventually. So just say thanks to Jill Sauter and the Synthesis Network for all of those midge tolerant wheat slides, all my Texan and summer students, all the funders, four decades of wheat midge researchers that I just presented to you in 45 minutes, and uh, Owen Olfert for making great life cycle slides.